G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I'm going to be covering a tutorial which I've done a couple of times now, but it's a bit of a special one this time. So I'm going to show you how to add parameters to families in a directory um, in bulk from a shared parameter file. Now the reason it's special is because this time I'm just using one custom package, which in this case is my own, it's called Crumple. Um, I finally got tired of having to tell people uh, where the custom packages were for adding families um, and how to get them off GitHub. I'll be honest, it just really became an inconvenience and I decided that it was easier for me to be able to control the source of the nodes that I use in my tutorial. So today I'll be showing you how to do this all the way through. I'll show you how to build the shared parameter file, how you can build a mapping file to guide the parameters that are selected, and then finally how you can actually add them in bulk and package the script up for Dynamo Player. Um, so I hope you enjoy this tutorial and find it useful and um, off we go. So to run through this workflow, you are gonna need a shared parameter file that Revit is currently pointing to. I've just created a new one here with two, four testing parameters in it. In this case, test dimension, test material, test number, and test text. Noting these are all of different parameter types. So you can see length and also material, number, and text. So in this case, I'm gonna be targeting these four parameters. Now, if you do look on GitHub under today's date with the video released, um, I do have a file you can populate with four columns to point to in this script to guide the parameters. So you don't have to write them all in Dynamo itself. This is my recommended approach and it means you can store multiple files with different configurations depending on which type of parameter push you're doing. So first of all, you can see I've typed in a name for my parameter, test underscore text. In this case, you can nominate a group that you wanna put it under in the model. So for example, maybe I'll put this one under identity data. Now notice this actually updates this built-in parameter group name. I have a lookup table pointing to a second table called variables, and I've just stored all the common parameter groups you might need to point to in your script. So in this case, um, most of them are the ones that I use at least to sort my parameters. So this just helps you pick the human friendly name, which is gonna drive the actual parameter group name that Revit relies on. We can also say whether we want to use an instance parameter. In this case, pick just two things to pick from. Typically, no or yes, true, false, one, zero, whatever you want to use, as long as you know what it is so you can predict it in your script. So in this case, let's say these are all gonna be type parameters. Now I'm just gonna copy all of these in here and I'm gonna say test material, tests number, and I believe the last one was test dimension. Now make sure you don't have any typos. This is really important. Probably one of the biggest issues with this workflow I've come across in the past is that people make typos and don't check them carefully. So check them carefully. Um, in this case, I'm gonna put some different things in different places, like my dimension I'll put under dimensions. And you can see the parameter group doesn't always make sense behind the scenes. For example, dimensions parameter group is called PG underscore geometry. A bit strange. I had to figure them all out myself just by playing with them. A little bit frustrating, um, but it is what it is. And we'll put our material under materials and finishes. So I might actually make the material parameter a instance parameter just so we can see the difference in how that works. So at this point, I'm gonna save my file and I'm gonna be pointing to it using Dynamo as well. So at this point, we're ready to begin. Now I'm in a family file at the moment. Um, it doesn't really matter, I think, what type of file you're in. Although I believe you might need to be in a family file because some of the nodes that I'm referring to want to run in a family specifically. But having said that, we'll be opening all these documents in the background instead. So I have already created a little library of families called test library. Um, I am just gonna make a copy of it in case anything goes wrong. And what I've done here is just copied four subfolders of families from the Autodesk library. And to begin with, we're probably just gonna target a small particular folder. So I'm just gonna, in this case, refer to this folder here. So let's open up Dynamo and actually get started with building our scripts. So in this case, the first thing we're gonna to want to do is import our actual Excel data and structure it in a way that suits our workflow. So I'm just gonna maximize Dynamo, make a new script and just save it. I'll just call it with scripts. So we're gonna begin in this case with a file path to point to our Excel file. In this case, I'm gonna be pointing to this file here that I've just saved. And I'm gonna turn it into a file object using file from path. Notice I'm currently in automatic mode. I'll stay in this mode for just a little while. But once we start pointing to family files, we'll need to switch to manual. So I'm making an import Excel 
And if your Excel doesn't work, you might need to repair your Windows online. I'm not gonna deal with that problem because it's a very big problem in Dynamo. Take it to the forums if you have it. Um, in this case, the sheet that we're pointing to will just be called standard, but your sheet might be called something different. Um, I am gonna read as text or strings and I'm not gonna show Excel. And as soon as I run this, we should get our Excel data. Now the first row is just the headers of our data, so we don't really need that. Um, in this case, I am just gonna use a rest of items node, which will just give me everything but the first object in the list, which is the headers. After this, I'm gonna transpose my list into columns instead of rows, so that we're now dealing with data in structured order. So in this case, um, we can see we're dealing with first our names, our group, the group that Dynamo expects, and also is it an instance parameter. At this point, we need to reconstruct this into three inputs. Um, now you could use three get item at index nodes. I prefer to use a code block. So in this case, um, I'm gonna say data zero, which is going to be the first object, which in this case is our parameter name. I'm gonna say data two, which is our parameter group and data three, which is, is the parameter instance based. And if you like, you can give these names just so you remember what they are. And finally, and then when I connect this, we're effectively breaking our data into three sets that we can process separately. The name, the parameter group name, and also is it an instance parameter? So at this point, we have to do a few things with our data. First of all, I am gonna use a custom node to turn, in this case, the parameter group name into its, its actual Revit built-in parameter group. So in this case, I'm using a node from Grump Crumple and I'm using built-in parameter groups by name. So in the background, this node is actually using Python to get the equivalent parameter group. So this isn't actually text anymore. It's actually in the format of a built-in parameter group. So inside the node, I'm using Python to effectively get all the built-in parameter groups and find in that list which one matches the name. And if one is found, it returns the actual built-in parameter group object instead. If you're not sure what built-in parameter groups are available, I do have a node called BIPGs that will give you pretty much all the built-in parameter groups and also their, their name as well as a string. So you can find the particular group that you're interested in. I think I also have another node, um, no I don't, I just have the one that uses the human friendly name in this case, but I believe in this case, if you go into this node, um, yeah, I can check the actual human friendly name in here as well. Actually, no, I can't. So, so you might have to look up the built-in parameter groups on the Autodesk uh, API docs. I believe they have a reference to them on there. So we've processed our built-in parameter groups by name. We now need to process is our parameter instance based. And to do this, we can just use an equal statement. What I can actually do is after this, just say, is this equal to yes? And this will effectively turn my output into booleans or trues and for true and false values that Dynamo can actually work with. Now, the hard thing we have to do now is actually take our parameter name and get the actual shared parameter itself, or what you might call the parameters external definition. That's the API term for it. To do this, I have to get all my shared parameters from my shared parameter file and find where it occurs in the file and get the corresponding parameter. Now, luckily again, I've made a node in Crumple for this called shared parameters flat, which gives you the flattened shared parameter file. And it's gonna give you the, the names of the parameters in the file, as well as their matching parameter definition and also their group name and group definition. So what we need to do here is find the index of, so we're using index of, and in our list of parameter names, where does each of these occur? And assuming that they're all present, you can see we get an index in that list. And what we can use is that index, but instead we use it. So I'm gonna say from my parameter definitions as a variable at index i, and I'm gonna take my definitions and get the definition at that particular index. So we've just remapped our parameter name into its corresponding parameter in our shared parameter file. Now, the reason I use a code block here is because if there is actually a missing shared parameter, you're gonna get an index of negative one. If you pass this into a get item at index node, you're gonna get a null value. However, what happens in this case otherwise is you're going to get the last object in the list. So you will technically add a parameter that's not correct, 
but it doesn't break the file entirely. I guess that's sort of the point of that workflow. Having said that, obviously you're gonna to wanna to make sure your parameters are named correctly and you're pointing to the right file. You could add some more error handling in there if you wanted to though. So what we have to do now is actually open our family documents. So at this point, I'm gonna to switch to manual mode because we only wanna do this once. First of all, I wanna get a directory of families. And in this case, I'm going to use my testing library and I'm just gonna pick one folder. In this case, I'm gonna pick just a subfolder. So I'm gonna take my directory contents and we can just use the standard node or I can use the one from Crumple. I prefer mine just because I know exactly how it works. Um, but in this case, I'm taking my directory path and I'm gonna provide a search string. In this case, I'm gonna use the search string .rfa. So if the family contains the Revit family file extension, it will be returned, otherwise it won't be. So now you can exclude things like type catalogs, for example. At this point, we should be able to return the paths of all families in there. Now I can go up one level deeper and do a deep search to get all the files in all the subfolders. We're gonna do that right at the end of this workflow. Now what we need to do now is actually open the family document. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure when you run this process that you both open and close the families in one run of the script, ideally. So I have a node in Crumple called family doc open. And again, make sure you're in manual mode at this point. But if you give this a file path, it's going to open those X number of families that you're currently pointing to. What we wanna do now is actually add the shared parameter. So I'm gonna use a node from Crumple, in this case, family document, add shared parameter. So the way that this node works is it will take any number of families provided, so family documents, which we now have or are going to have, it's gonna take any number of parameter names, built-in parameter groups and instance settings, and to each of those families, it's gonna apply that setting. So this node is really made for bulk family parameter updating or addition. Um, it's not made to do a custom set per family. You'd need a slightly different list structure to do that, but having said that, I have written this in Python. So the way that the node does work is exposed for people to experiment with if they want to. It's not super complicated. Um, it actually was quite simple to figure it out, um, having you know learned more about the Revit API since the last time I did this workflow. So I'm now gonna connect my parameter definitions, my built-in parameter groups, and is the parameter instance-based? And I'll just move it down like that. Now what, what's gonna happen now is it's gonna open all those documents add all the parameters, but then we need to close the documents and save them when we're done to finish the process. So first of all, I need to tell my script to wait for this step to happen. So I'm gonna wait for this outcome to finish, and then I'm gonna feed through my family documents that I used originally, because we need to close those family documents. I'm now gonna use the final node from Crumple, which is family doc close. And I'm going to say family documents. So what it's going to do is pass through this data once this is finished. Um, you might have seen this in other packages called pass through. It's quite a common node. But, and we also do want to save as well. So at this point, I'm going to save my script and I am going to run it. But first, I'm going to also open the folder where all those families are being opened from. Which is this folder here. And we should eventually see these families get saved. We'll also see a backup file generated, which will tell us that the process is finished. So I'm gonna hit run and open that folder. Revit's gonna open these families first in the background and you can see it was very quick. It ran that process extremely quickly because um, it was only a few families, but we can see what's happened here. So we've opened our directory. We've opened our families as family documents. We've passed them through so we can see those four parameters were successfully added to all those families. So we have three families times four parameters. The wait for has then passed through the document and finally we've successfully closed the document. So assuming that this workflow has worked, these families should now have those new parameters. Let's just open one of them and check. And sure enough, we have our test material under materials and finishes. We have in this case our test dimension under dimensions, and we have our number and our test text parameter under identity data. So it has successfully worked, at least for one family. We can check another one just to make sure it did work in bulk. But based on what I'm seeing, I'm quite confident this has worked. Perfect, so it's worked exactly as intended. Um, so it's a really powerful workflow. Having said that, you can always go one level deeper 
and do an entire directory. So let's just make a little bit of an adjustment to the script. Just one change in input. And this time we're going to tell it to do a deep search at one level higher than where we operated from. So test library. And I'm going to say true for a deep search. Now this is going to take longer because we have more families to deal with. I'll go to a bigger folder, run the script. Now there are some families in there already that have those parameters. So we would expect in those cases, the parameters will not be added. In that case, the, the, the script will still process properly. It will just fail to add the parameters to those particular families, which is fine because they're already there. We can see it's working its way through the families one by one. We can see those backup files being generated. And it should go to the next folder now. And there it is, it's still going. It's getting there. And we should expect in this case, it's gonna try and add the parameters to these one, fail, save the family anyway and then move on to these right at the end. We can see the script still worked at the same scale. It's worked across all those families, all 43 of them. It's still saved and closed. Now we can see in this case, some of the families should not have had it added. See, in this case, these families said parameter not added because it already had those parameters. So I've built this script and node to effectively support the workflow without generating any errors um, in that event. Now, some people would usually pass a null in that case, which would generate an error. Uh, for this particular workflow, I do prefer to design it so it does actually not give you errors, so the users don't freak out if something like that would happen. Now, if you want to build this for Dynamo Player, you're going to want to make a few customizable inputs. First of all, your file path, and you might want to call this uh, parameters file location, or maybe your parameters guidance file. So they don't think it's a shared parameters file. You're probably going to want to add a string input for the work the worksheet in Excel. Because that might be different depending on the type of workflow you're engaging in. And what I'll do is I'll just get rid of that and repath these two inputs. You're definitely going to want to be able to point to your directory. So which directory are your families in and you're definitely going to want to turn the deep search into a true and we'll set it to false by default but I'll just call this include subdirectories infinite depth so they understand that it's going to go all the way into those subdirectories if it finds any if it's true definitely make that that false by default Otherwise, everything else is pretty much as intended. I believe that should give you a fairly stable tool in Dynamo Player. We can really quickly just test how that looks in Dynamo Player. Mm, okay, weird, a bug that didn't crash anything. But in this case, um, if I open up Dynamo Player and point to that script, we should see those inputs available to the user. Now you could add some outputs as well. Um, to show what happened. So you could always do the output message of the parameter node, or you could do a true false Boolean list to show the families it failed on. Um, so if any of them contain a parameter not added, you could, you could capture that as a Boolean. But in this case, we can have a look at our inputs. And to a standard user, they would now be able to run the script without having to go into Dynamo itself, which is how I recommend you run nearly every single script you have. Um, and we can see now that we're also able to point to our Excel file point to a directory such as maybe the base cabinets, call this sheet one, uh, actually no standard. And we aren't gonna include subdirectories and off it goes. It runs exactly the same way, but through a, a more easy workflow. So I hope that this has been a, a useful tutorial and helps you better understand how the workflow actually functions and also gives you a package which is slightly easier to understand and obviously much easier to install. So thanks. Uh, so there we have it, uh, a pretty powerful workflow when you're managing family libraries and trying to customize lots of families at once. Um, I do use this quite often. I used it a lot when I built my own family library, but to own the nodes in my package now and be able to control that at its source is a big deal to me. Um, and I hope it does make it easier to understand the workflow now that you can actually read the script for this in Python inside the nodes. Having said that, I don't want this to be a bashing video for the authors of other packages that we know 
have you know difficulty in installation because people don't necessarily know how to use github or don't know how to read instructions i'll be honest it's not that hard but um at the same time i don't want this to be a, a, a bash against you know i'll just say it awkward um you know I, that, that package still does a lot of heavy lifting for me um and has really helped me out so at the same time you know i would recommend looking at orchid as well because it does still have a lot of other things that i don't put in my own package quite intentionally um, but i hope it was useful Anyway, um, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future similar videos. Thanks, take care.